It's December, as Counting Crows might have said, and in just one month, Oregon lawmakers will reconvene in Salem for the short legislative session in 2018. Here to give us some of the lowdown, some of the rundown on what's happening, Representative Alyssa Kenny Geyer and Representative Ken Helm. Representative Kenny Guy represents District 46, North and excuse me, Northeast and Southeast Portland. Good morning, Representative. Hey, Jefferson. How are you? I'm all right. Representative Helm, District 34, Beaverton, West Haven, Cedar Hills, hey. and Rock Creek. I don't Good think morning. I've been to West Haven, Representative Helm. Well, you ought to go. Where is it? I assume it's near Beaverton. It's uh, the, it's the neighborhoods that are essentially to the north of St. Vincent's Hospital. Really, really nifty uh, neighborhoods that were developed, I think, mostly in the 50s and 60s. Is it unincorporated Washington County, or is it incorporated as West Haven? It's not incorporated as West Haven. I think it is largely uh, unincorporated Washington County. That's why, because I was used to just call it unincorporated Washington County, but now they have a cool name. (laughs) Does a cool name name mean that you're campaigning for them to also become incorporated, or is that the kind of toxic political issue you must stay entirely away from? (laughs) I haven't tiptoed into that. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Kenny Geyer, let's start with just a little sausage making. Uh, remind folks how the, the short session is different from the regular session. We already know because what it's called, it's shorter. Yeah, that's right. It's only five weeks, whereas the long session, which is the first year of the biennium, is five and a half months. And the short session was voted in as an annual session by the voters in the 2010 elections. So the first short session we ever had was 2012. That was a session in which I overlapped with you, Jefferson. Yeah. Um, may have been our only only session besides the special, the notorious special session. And the um, the other big difference between besides the time, of course, the short the duration, is that uh, in a long session we set the overall budget and we have an unlimited number of bills that each legislator and the governor can introduce. In the uh, short session, every legislator in the House is only allowed two personal bills, and in the Senate, for the first time this year, can only introduce one personal bill, and each committee can only introduce three bills. The governor can only introduce, I think it might be three bills, or it may be five. So it's very limited. The idea behind it is that um, since we have a a second crack at the apple, I guess, bite at the apple, is the intention is that if there were, um, first of all, with the budget, if we need to tweak the budget because revenues came in uh, significantly more or less than what we predicted, we can tweak the budget. But also, we recognize that often when we pass bills, there may be unintended consequences, and so it's an opportunity to fix that kind of scenario. And then thirdly, if there's some kind of emergency situation that um, that uh, occurs that we're able to deal with that as well. And then lastly, and this might be, I think everyone would agree to all those, I think the one that um, there may be some controversy around is that many people feel, look, here's an opportunity not to wait forever. If you've got, if a bill has had a, a lot of hearings, a lot of work, it's been in front of the legislature, it's been hashed over, and it almost caught past the finish line but didn't, then um, why wait another two years? This is an opportunity to do that. And so uh, those are the four reasons that bills come forward in the short session. Representative Helm, what do you see? I want to ask both of you about your particular priorities, and thanks so much for spending the time this morning. What do you see as some of the biggest issues that are going to come up? In asking about this in the past, it is not my impression up to now. I would love to be disabused of this misimpression, if it is such a misimpression, that a big housing thing will come up. Uh, it's not clear that a big corporate tax will come up. We think that a health care thing might come up if, one, if, if the uh, measure before the voters 101 goes down. Uh, what do you see as some of the big things that are going to be up in front of you and your colleagues this coming new year? Well, in the in the world in which I work, um, the clean energy jobs bill is going to be the biggest thing to hit the legislature um, in February. Uh, this is an issue that has has been uh, in the hopper for a long, long time. Uh, certainly, since the early 2000s, there have been proposals for some sort of carbon pricing system, and um, we've gained knowledge and experience from other states and other countries in how to do it recently. Uh, and it's an issue that just seems to have percolated to the top. Senator Dembro and I have been working hard on uh, refining uh, a, a concept of 
joining California, Quebec, and Ontario in a carbon trading market uh, in a way that benefits Oregon. Uh, we worked sort of uh, not under the radar, but um, out of the typical committee um, system in 2017 by holding, a, um, I think we held eight or more informational sessions just to get people more comfortable with the concepts and how uh, the carbon trading system works. And then we've been working in the interim toward that same goal. So I that think that, that bill is ready for prime time. Uh, it's got a lot of good thinking behind it, and uh, we're ready. So the idea of, of cap and trade, or the idea of, of a carbon cap and invest plan is you say, okay, if we're going to do something about, about climate change, if we're going to uh, put some limit on emissions, let's in fact limit them, and then people will get credits, and they can trade the credits. And rather than us saying, well, nobody shall emit more than this amount, and then different then an organization can say, well, we're not one company with that amount, we're 10 companies, and we only do one-ninth of that amount each, then they instead say, no, there's an overall amount, and then they can trade these credits and create a market. What is the, you say it's ready for prime time, what is in the bill? You don't have to read it word for word here, but what are the, what are the key elements? Uh, the, the key elements are uh, a connection to the Western Climate Initiative, which is California, Quebec, and Ontario, um, with uh, other Canadian provinces apparently considering joining. It's just what you said. Um, the, the, the interesting thing is that free market economists have been pushing this for a long time. Um, a trading system allows changes in the economy for what are deemed to be the most efficient and lowest price. So this, uh, the, the carbon trading market, I am told, came out of some thinking during the Reagan era. And it, it follows free market principles. Um, the, so that's the basic uh, principle you have a carbon tr uh, allocation trading market. Um, entities that emit um, greenhouse gases over 25,000 metric tons a year would be subject to the cap, and um, they would be subject, subject to complying with that cap, and they could do so either by um, buying technology or increasing their own efficiency to drive those carbon emissions down or going to the market uh, and getting credits to comply with their um, with the cap. They could also do it by participating in what we call offset programs, which are actually end up being <clears throat> projects on the ground that sequester carbon over time. They're allowed to do that too. Representative Kenny Guy, let's have you jump in also on this. What are you hearing from folks about this, or what questions do you get from constituents around something like a carbon trade, carbon cap and trade system? Uh, does the issue even come up? Yes, it comes up <coughs> all the time. And uh, my constituents in southeast, northeast Portland, for the most part, are incredibly supportive of this. And I do want to say in terms of short session, I think some of the questions come up is, you know, is this the time for short session? Does this fall into the category of almost passed or emergency? And in my opinion, absolutely. This is, if you look at the last year of fires across Oregon, across California, now what we're seeing in Southern California in December, uh, hurricanes, etc. Our climate is absolutely in an emergency state. And I wish that we had passed this several years ago. I've actually been a sponsor of that bill for several, ever since I got into the legislature. There's been a version of it. There's been a lot of work on it. So in the category of has there been a lot of work or are we trying to sneak something through quickly in a, in a short session, there's been a lot of work and a lot of attention and a lot of groups. And I agree with Representative Helm, that this is one of the absolute top issues that will occupy the um, legislature uh, in this session, as it should be. Um, this, I am, they are doing incredible work. My own Senator Dembro and Representative Helm leading this effort. There are many different subgroups on one on agriculture, one on utilities, one on regulated industries. The one that I serve on is environmental justice and just transition. It's uh, chaired by Representative Diego uh, uh, Diego Hernandez, who's in the district right next to mine, just east of mine, and, re and Representative Pam Marsh from Ashland. Um, and that's really looking at making sure that we pay attention to the frontline communities who are most impacted by climate change and any transition from a fossil fuel economy to a clean energy economy. We want to make sure that if there are workers that get displaced or consumers that have any other higher costs, that we look at strategies to reinvest in those, that take some of the revenue 
from the cap and invest program and reinvest it in those communities. Um, so uh, they have done absolutely incredible work, and I strongly believe that um, it should be the top one of the top priorities in the session and must be passed in this session. So kudos to Rep. Helm and Senator Dembro and all the people working on this. So Representative Helm, who decides the cap? Is that this Western Climate Initiative? Is this this outside agitator group? Is this a bunch of Canadians and Californians deciding how much I can drive? I was just trying no. to do my Lars Larson impression. <laughs> you, you sound sufficiently conspiratorial there. Um, no. The, these, are, these are goals the state has set itself, and uh, my memory is that, that we set some goals for carbon reduction from the state back in 2009. This bill would follow those um, in principle and set some new ones that were, are in line with uh, the goals that we set previously. So, no, um, we're, we're not just following along with California in that regard. We're also not following along with California and many other aspects. We, we want to link with their system in order to trade uh, the credits, but we, we're not just importing California system here. We have to make it work for Oregon, and that's what we've done. The critique from the right, and this is too simplistically put, but I will maintain simplicity for purposes of communication. The critique from the right is, ah, this is, I don't know, fluffy-hearted liberal uh, stuff trying to, it's going to increase costs for people who make stuff. The what is the primary other than like oil producers and energy producers? Is it shippers? What's the resistance here? The people who are going to go in and try to kill this in the Senate, if not the House, what are they claiming? Well, uh, I'll give voice to some very real concerns. Um, you, you you never know whether these concerns are actually backed up with data, but um, but I take them seriously, and that is um, on a couple of fronts. You don't want to create a system that puts so much burden on industries that um, have have the opportunity to move around the country or maybe even move globally um, such that uh, they'll think about leaving the state. What we would like them to do is stay in the state, reduce their carbon emissions, continue to employ people, and flourish. And so we have tried very carefully to make sure that as this program introduces itself um, uh, sometime after 2021, that it, it does so in an even and predictable way that isn't a shock to the economy. Um, that will allow those industries to stay, plan for the changes, and do the good work that we want them to do in emissions reduction while still being able to make a profit. So th those are some, uh, those are the initial fears is that uh, we will put some pressure on prices and especially if you're trade exposed and, and you're trading nationally or globally, that you remain competitive. Um, and it's the bill's intention that we allow those businesses to, to continue to be competitive in the market. Representative Kenny Guy, I've heard at least two critiques that I would say, again, using my simplistic frame from the left. Uh, one of them you mentioned, which is, okay, well, if you increase the price potentially of carbon bearing goods and services, if you do, if you engage in Pigouvian taxation, that's great for internalizing costs of behavior, but then externalizing those costs or, or, or rather internalizing those costs and having people pay for them uh, does in fact impact people who have to buy stuff. And that it disproportionately impacts people who don't have as much money to buy stuff. And so that's why you were talking about the Diego Hernandez's work and that, yeah, maybe it's not going to have, uh, it's not going to figure out the cost side of how do you actually not have it impact uh, particular communities, but maybe you can turn around and take some of the money that was raised and buy some good stuff for people. Uh, feel free to say anything more on that. Or is there any other critique that you're getting? I can think of at least one that we heard from, uh, that we heard from Peter DeFazio, but any other argument you're hearing, counter argument from the left that you have to contend with? Well, uh, so to address the first part, um, price, consumer prices may go up in certain areas, and you know that that is kind of common sense. If you're going to put a price on on carbon and on oil, that heating oil and and uh, oil for your car is is going to go up to some degree. And so, what's important and what we're trying to figure out, and this bill is proposing, is that you reinvest that in some way. And so, somebody in terms of like you know your heating cost in your house you ideally want to put money into weatherization programs that can help your home uh, be more efficient 
so that you're, even if the price per unit of heat is more, because you're more efficient, the price comes out the same. And not only that, but you, so you're, you're keeping the cost the same for consumers while you're reducing the carbon output. And, and not only that, but you can also train a workforce that has typically not had as many jobs. So you're really developing the, the green economy by doing that. Now, obviously, we're not going to develop enough weatherization programs, a big enough workforce to hit all of the homes. And so the other idea is, all right, to the extent that people can't get help with increased efficiency of their homes, then there should be some kind of rebate program to make sure that their utility costs don't go up. So that's just an example in one particular sector of what the cap and invest, the invest part of the cap and invest is really looking at very thoughtfully. The uh, other concern um, from the left has been, hey, we don't really believe in this free market trading system. We think that you should just regulate. Why should companies who have more money be able to uh, Yeah, why do know, rich trade? kids get to pollute? Right. And I think that um, Representative Helm, you know, handled that head on. Um, I mean, first of all, the it's kids. a political reality that uh, a, a strict regulation you know, strategy is much more likely to fail. Um, and I, but the other, the other piece of it is not just the political side, but the policy side. Um, we, we don't want groups to necessarily leave. Now, there's a debate about that. Some are like, well, fine, if they leave, that's fine because we don't want the carbon polluters in in our state. So, good riddance to them. But the truth is, first of all, it could be a big hit on our economy, and secondly. They'll take their operations and go somewhere else, and that's not really Oregon contributing to lowering the carbon output of our planet, which is really necessary. So I I support the strategy of the cap and invest. I support joining California, Ontario, and others in in creating a larger market because the larger the market is for for trading, the more efficient that will become, the more others will want to join in. And so um, it's, it's a really exciting bill. Let's move on to other issues, and we will want to come back to this and hope that you all be willing to spend some time as we do. Uh, Representative Helm, other, any other priority that you have time or bandwidth for? Is this one of your two bills, or does this count because it's a larger priority as a committee bill, so you're still doing two other bills? Um, this is one of my two personal bills, um, the, uh, and I've made it a priority because, um, you know, we want to show through having it be a personal bill of mine that... Um, all the folks in the legislature that support it from the outset. So we'll be able to see who's for this and who is not. And let me let me do just a little bit of sausage-making explanation there. If it's a committee bill, it's just that, oh, this is a bill of the committee. If it's a bill of a member, then members can sign on. Any member who wants to, you can take it around the hallways and say, hey, does your member or do you as a member want to sign on? And, that mean, and that's what you're saying, that people have a chance to become co-sponsors. How many co-sponsors you got so far? Well, the, in the bill that Senator Dembro and, and I uh, submitted right at the end of 2017 as the culmination of everything we had learned um, in that session through the info session, uh, Senate Bill 1070, I think my memory is that we had 30 to 33 co-signers. So that does not mean that all those folks, uh, when they um, see the revisions that we've made, which we think are improvements. I'm not speaking for them and saying they're going to re-sign up, but that's that's the last bill that we had where you could sign on. And those are all those are all House members. Or that was both uh, both chambers. Both chambers. Got it. And what are the uh, what are the prospects in the Senate? Uh, or am I wrong to think that you have an easier time in the House? Um, I think we've had a little bit more support in the House, and and I want to particularly um, remind folks that our speaker, Tina Kotek, and our majority leader, um, Jennifer Williamson, have been extremely supportive in 2017 and in the interim of pursuing this objective, and they remain committed to this bill. Representative Kenny Geyer, anything happening on schools? And if you want to change the subject to something else, I suppose you can do that. But anything happening on schools, I recognize that 
with a lot of controversy in Portland public schools, but when Democrats are in charge, it tends to be sort of uncomfortable to go after our public schools because so much of what we want to do is make sure there's sufficient resource for our public schools to flourish. And if you starve them, they can't. And there'll be more mistakes, not fewer. But anything that is, any concerns you have uh, with Senate Bill 20 on the table that we got a text about with Portland public schools uh, potentially shutting down some special education programs, anything that you're looking at with respect to education in schools? Yeah, let me answer that quickly, and let me make sure, because I'm not sure how much time we have in this interview, that we get to my top priority in the next session. Do uh, both. Besi- <laughs> yeah, which is, uh, is a housing bill, which is another emergency. Um, but to answer your question, uh, I'm very concerned about the Pioneer School shutting down. I support Access Academy, and I think they need a home, and I don't like that they appear to be pitted against each other, and I know both communities are working hard to support each other, the disability community and the TAG community. But um, Pioneer School is in in the heart of my district, and I chair Human Services and Housing. And Human Services, of course, is the place where we look at a lot of the bills that deal with people with disabilities, which the school, um, you know, is a, a, is an alternative education program for that. And I've got a lot of people who are very strongly in favor of keeping that program um, alive. Uh, they they want to make sure that it's person centered education. There may be changes, you know, to the curriculum and improvements, but they uh, very strongly want to keep Pioneer School, and there was a big school board meeting, uh, I think it was on Wednesday night, uh, with a strong show of support from the community, so I um, signed a petition, I've uh, written to Portland Public Schools um, about this, but I hope that they will reconsider that decision and keep that school open. Talk about your housing bill uh, before we before we wrap. Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity to do that. So again, I'm chair of Human Services and Housing. Uh, I became chair of that committee in 2015, which is the same year that both Eugene and Portland declared a state of emergency in housing. And we know housing has been a struggle for low-income people for decades, but it's gotten worse and worse and worse to the point where uh, you, you know I, no one can avoid seeing that it is one of the top issues facing our our population, our economy. Um, we've got people sleeping in the streets. We have businesses closing down, particularly on the coast where they can't even hire people anymore because there's absolutely no housing for people to work in their schools, their, their um, firefighter operations, their restaurants, their hospitals. And uh, this is true of all, particularly all the areas where people have second homes, um, Hood River, Central Oregon, the coast, you know, popular areas where any housing that has been developed is um, eaten up by number of second homes. For instance, in Tillamook, I think they've built 2,400 homes over the last decade. 2,700 homes have become vacation homes. So um, there's a net loss, and while our population is growing, and it's a huge, huge issue. So we have a lot of issues, a lot of housing bills we put on the table in the recent years, some of which have passed. We've made a significant, um, unprecedented increase in investment in the legislature in the housing issue, but it's nowhere close to enough. And in the federal government, in the tax bill right now, in the House version, they are looking at cutting back, they're cutting out private activity bonds and low-income housing tax credits, which is part of where we get our money for the supply of affordable housing. So this will be absolutely devastating. It's already a devastating situation. The federal tax cut package will make it even worse. So in a short session, you can't do a lot. The one biggest priority bill that I have is to raise the document recording fee. This is the fee that the county clerks collect when they're, when they're, uh, in a home sale, the buyer pays when they have the the deed um, recorded by the county that they now own this property. The fee right now is twenty dollars, and we propose raising it to seventy five dollars. The amount of money that this brings in for affordable housing is currently thirty million dollars a biennium, and it would go up to one hundred and twelve point five million dollars. That's an eighty two million dollar increase. It's very very. Um, significant injection of much needed do you money. Need, do you need a supermajority? And we're about to wrap it. Do you need a supermajority to get it passed? We need three-fifths majority. We're working, we're working really hard. I'm actually going around the state talking to um, city council people, ca- uh, mayors, county commissioners, as well as housing advocates. Many of the places that I'm going to have Republican local officials who are saying thank you for considering this because this problem has fallen in the lap of cities and counties. 
and they're getting very little help from the state and yeah. the federal government, and they desperately need this help. And so there's been a lot of support for it. We do need a three-fifths majority, so we're working hard for that. No, that's a big one. That's a big one. And you got any Republicans so far? I know I just called Republicans. So Repu- um, there have been Republicans that are supportive of this concept. Uh, unlike Representative Kelm on his bill, I'm actually making this a committee bill. Um, I Because I need a three-fifths majority, I had a bit of a concern that Republicans would hold back on supporting it, and I didn't want a bill to come out with only Democratic names when I need um, a bipartisan support to, to, <coughs> to pass it. Right. And so I wanted to make sure that um, it had the best chance of passing, and I thought that putting it as a committee bill would, would give it that best chance. Ken Helm, that's our cue. We did get a question from a listener. Anything on land use coming up in the short session? Representative Helm is taking the Fifth Amendment on that question. We will ask uh, again. Oh, there he is. Jefferson, I, I, uh, I've heard rumor of uh, a land use bill that, that revised the notion of, um, of, of somehow reducing or releasing some of the requirements for land use planning in uh, eastern Oregon counties, but I haven't seen the actual bill. Um, I know it's, that concept has had a very tough time in the past, um, but we'll just have to see what it looks like to see whether um, it fits and is consistent with our existing system. Well, when we find out more, we'd love to have you back on. Representative Alyssa Kenny Geyer, Representative Ken Helm, thank you both so much for joining us. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. My pleasure. Bye-bye.